There you have it. The meeting is being recorded. Oh, I didn't put up the continuing education credit link, did I? Give me just a second to do that. Okay, my apologies. So they're in the chat pod, and that will stay in the chat pod. So foresters can um, can click on that at any point in time. Although I check the timestamps, and I'm able to cross reference with the participant list to make sure, because only we can only offer continuing education credits for participants who are in the live presentation. So if you're looking for some type of continuing education credit for the Society of American Foresters or for something else, please uh, click that link and it'll, it'll solicit from you your name and your email address and then I can provide a, uh, an email documentation of your participation. So let me, with this, jump into our presentation mode. I'll introduce myself. My name's Peter Smallage. I'm the New York State Extension Forester. You should see a screen that's loading. That's my presentation for the day. Uh, we're going to be talking about management for the next forest. The emphasis here is on the next forest, and so we're really looking at and thinking about uh, regenerating the forest, and, and more specifically still trying to identify those barriers that may be uh, interfering with the regeneration of that next forest. So we're going to be I'm going to build initially build the case for uh, why I think we need to have this conversation. Uh, and obviously, you're, you're, you've, you've uh, correctly presupposed that if uh, we're talking about it, that that uh, at least I think that there's some concerns here. Uh, before we get into that, let me um, start by. Just pointing out that what we're what our objective is, I think, when I think about the next forest, it's not just creating another landscape that's covered with woody plants that have green leaves. In fact, what I'm um, thinking about and what I think a lot of people are thinking about, this is not just me, there's a lot of people that look at this and think about this, is to ensure that we're going to recreate the same type and capacity of forest that we have today. And the, the fall color shot there at the bottom, I think, is a nice way to illustrate the diversity and the variety of species that we have on our landscape. Um, for those of you that are quick, OK, Sally says it's not, the presentation's not evident. Can, is that the case for other people? Can you see it or not? Okay, so some of you are seeing it, some of you aren't. Um, so that means it's okay. Thank you. So that means it is. Uh, it's it's uh, it's leaving the Cornell cyberspace, and something's happening. Must be uh, as it gets in your direction. So if you can't see it, what you might want to do is um, is exit. Um, and you, have, you should specifically exit and then log back in so that you don't get a double connection because then you'll get an echo that will drive you nuts. Um, so try that. Um, my apologies for those of you that can't see it, but I'm not. Uh, it sounds like you know, there's the, the mid, and it's not. This isn't a majority kind of thing, but there's enough people that are seeing it that makes me think that it's doing okay. So, so our focus is on recreating the forests that we currently have and making sure that we have that same those same benefits and values uh, services that we enjoy today are going to be enjoyed in the future uh, those of you that are are quick and astute will look at the the picture in the bottom there the fall color picture and you will notice that there is a scattering of some uh, invasive shrubs here these 
these shrubs are characteristic. You know, the fall color of the of the native species is contrasted with the green color and the sustained photosynthesis of the uh, non-native species. As we um, so, if we think about those pictures, we're illustrating the current forest, and we need to be thinking about the next forest. The next forest obviously starts with plants that are on the ground. So these are just some pictures that are illustrating some areas where I've seen some, you know, some evidence of forest regeneration establishing. You'll notice that with the the one exception of the pic picture in the upper left-hand corner, these are all seedlings, uh, young seedlings. So this is uh, this is the this is the first. It's not quite the first step because we have to produce the seed. The seed has to be disseminated, germinate, establish, and then grow for at least a couple of years to get to the point where it is. Uh, where it looks like these. But what we really want to accomplish is something where we have head high regeneration. And all of these are pictures of regeneration that's in the five foot or taller range. And, and we've, we kind of set that five foot threshold because Also important to note for those of you that are, are are pretty good at tree identification, you'll see that that the species that are present here, and it's a lot of sugar maple, but some mixtures with some other desirable species. It's more than just having uh, something green on the ground. We want to have uh, the correct species present. in New York and we asked them uh, a series of questions about regeneration and we said essentially we, we asked them to um, to consider the forest stand that they were in most recently where there had been enough cutting so there's enough sunlight being added to the forest floor that they would expect that forest to have developed and adequately abundant five foot tall seedlings. And what we found statewide was that 30% of the foresters or 30% of the stands that foresters had visited were classified as highly or moderately successful. So that means that something on the order of 70% were classified as either marginally successful deliberate measurement of on-the-ground uh, seedling abundance or sapling abundance. But it's one of those indicators that says maybe there's some problems that are, that are out there. Um, we obviously were thinking that there are some problems because we initiated the survey. And there's a link to that resource. And there, uh, just so you Welcome to do the last slide of the presentation. I've accumulated all of those resources, and I will make those available through the Cornell Forest Connect .ning site as well. So you don't you don't need to be struggling to trying to write those down. Um, I'll just point out that this this particular table in a discussion of one of the impacts or one of the one of the the. work that was done by the Nature Conservancy um, at the same time that we were doing the Forester Survey, unbeknownst to, I think, either of us. And it was a system based on seedlings, which were relatively short, and saplings, which were taller. And this index was used to characterize the um, the abundance of of uh, of regeneration, and this graphic illustrates uh, timber species. So these are desirable timber species, and the regeneration index is red and orange for poor and fair. 
Uh, you can see that that's fairly well distributed across the state. The green colors indicate good or very good. So the, the best evidence of regeneration on these, uh, these are US Forest Service FIA permanent plots. Uh, there's pretty good regeneration scattered around the Adirondacks and patchily throughout uh, central New York in the southern tier. Another way to look at this is in this next image where uh, they have on the left hand side, and uh, this is a little fuzzy, so don't think that it's, um, uh, don't, don't think that this, you know, your, your eyesight's going bad. The, the image on the left uh, labeled A is the, the percentage of these forest inventory and analysis plots by regeneration category based on on canopy species. So these are species that are able to reach the canopy, which is a broader set than the B graph or the graph are for timber species. So that's a more narrow subset. And you can see that the um, that there's a change that you get very good regeneration uh, potential when you're considering species that can reach the canopy, which is largely species like beech. Um, but then when you exclude just the timber species that your your index of success declines. So we need to be thinking about if, if these problems are real, and I'm going to try and make the case in the next hour or 50 minutes that, in fact, they are real, that uh, there are some, some management activities that we're going to have to undertake. Um, but in, and this is a, these are rhetorical questions. So you can, you, I, I guess if you want to answer them in the chat pod, you can. But just I want you to be thinking about this as we're going through. Based on your experiences and observation, does a regeneration problem loom in New York and or more broadly throughout the Northeast and other Eastern hardwood states? And it's important to differentiate this question from the question of whether we are growing more wood. And that's often an index that you'll see uh, presented when I say, well, I think we have a regeneration problem. And people say, well, we're growing wood at three times the rate that we're cutting it. Well, I don't doubt that, but the um, that's different because the growing wood at three times the rate um, that we're cutting it simply means or may be explained by the fact that we've accumulated um, seedling saplings and pole timber in previous decades and those are coming into maturity. And so that's different from asking the question of whether we can regenerate forest stands after harvesting. So if we do a harvest and foresters um, are should expect of themselves the ability to regenerate stands in a, in a proficient fashion, can we do that effectively? Or are there are things that are limiting them. If we're being limited, then what management actions do we need to consider? And this is just these are just uh, kind of a collage of pictures that we'll be talking about later. So let's start by looking at a history of forest development and use in the Northeast. Uh, historically, of course, uh, and I'll I'll be using New York and the Northeast and the Eastern states fairly synonymously. I realize that there's differences within those regions, but I think there's enough commonality that we can make some, some general statements. Uh, and for those of you that, you know, we've got some Vermonters and, and uh, Mainers and Virginians, um, as there are distinctions from what you're seeing and what I'm talking about, I welcome you to point those out so that we can, we can capture some of that regional, regional variation. But the eastern states, northeastern states, were historically heavily forested. And there were um, there's there's suggestions that there may have been two to five percent at least in New York two to five percent of the forest or of the landscape was early successional or non forested prior to European colonization and of course when the when the Europeans arrived uh, they started developing farms and at least in New York that uh, farming was was uh, expansive. And by the late 1800s, uh, 1880, farming and agriculture in New York peaked. Out of 30 million acres, almost 25 million acres was in farmland production. Uh, I've heard that uh, about that time in the late 1880s, the demand for hay for horses in New York City declined. And associated with that was a decline in agriculture. Uh, because there's 30 million acres, if most of it's in farmland, then most of it is not in forest land. But as that forest land 
or as that farmland starts to decline, uh, forest land is going to be on the upswing. The, the forests want to grow in our eastern climates, and what we see then is this shift from about uh, 5 to 7 million acres of forest land at the turn of the previous century up to a point now in New York where we have about 18 million acres of forest. Seventy to a hundred year range, and those forests, as they develop, in all forests, whether it was then or now, have to deal with a number of factors. Uh, here's a kind of a general collection of factors that influence the ability of a forest to establish, to grow, and to develop. And by develop, I mean to to have adequate stocking. forests to produce. And within any given site, uh, typically the most one of the more dominant features. Uh, this is an illustration of a hill The, uh, the building in the center of both pictures is basically You can see, in fact, some of the, the vertical rows going up and down that hill. There's a fence line and a few scattered trees here and there. And you can imagine Game laws, or essentially no game laws in the late 1800s. So when a fast forward a hundred years, and you will see that uh, this hillside is now fully forested, and there are uh, different. conditions uh, that were present in 1870. So the point of all this, this section, is that the Northeast is uh, historically very heavily forested. This and development of those forests. The current forests that we see that, that occupy our land are current forests developed on those um, abandoned agricultural grounds. Because of that, the regeneration of the current forest developed without much overhead shade and essentially in the absence of a deer herd. So the, the and I'll be contrasting those last two items in just a moment, trying to make the case that those, in particular, those two things have changed. Um, Ryan says, heavily forested, but what kind of forest oak chestnut blueberry indicate intensive management? Um, so the chestnut, uh, chestnut obviously had uh, had its own suite of problems or its own particular problem that initiated in the early 1900s. Uh, oak and blueberry may not indicate intensive management, but uh, may just be a site condition. So it, you can certainly accomplish that through intensive management. And fire. Uh, fire is often not a common feature, uh, certainly not in our current landscape. I'm not aware of the extent of fire um, as, a, as a broad scale pattern in our historic forests. Sally's mount um, invasive plant species is, is another difference. And we will certainly come back to that.
Okay, so what are we looking at with our current forests? Uh, in New York, and this is, I think, a fairly similar pattern to a lot of the Northeast, and I think maybe in the New England states, the abundance of forest land may be a higher percentage of the land base. Uh, but in New York, the, the forest land occupies about two-thirds of the state, and the state is 30 million acres, and about 18 million acres are forested. Uh, then there's some non-forest land, pasture land, and then agricultural land. And in New York, of the 57 counties, more than 50 or yeah, more than 50% of those have are more than 50% forest land. So New York is a forested state, which for people that are from away from New York, uh, often think of New York City and can't imagine that there are actually trees in the state. The pattern of ownership, again, is going to be consistent throughout the eastern states where the overwhelming majority of land is in family or what was uh, has often been called non-industrial private forest land. These are family ownerships where people own 10 acres or 30 acres or 200 acres. Uh, there's been some recent dynamics in terms of, of shifting lands between um, timber industry, the wood utilizing industry, and timber investment groups. Uh, the business section here in New York is reported as being almost a third of the ownership. I have two different statistics that I've seen, and so the references for both of those relative to family ownership are listed at the bottom. The Northeastern Association of State Foresters, the NEFA Info, that first link reports 59% ownership, and then a Northeastern Area Forest Service publication reports a 73% family ownership. So whichever those are, between 60 and 70% is going to be family owned. And so that's in striking contrast to other parts of the country in the West, for example, where you may have a much greater dominance of, of public lands or in some parts of the Northeast where there's, there might be more um, industrial or investment ownerships. The way the forest has changed through time tells us uh, a couple of interesting things. So if we look at the, at the black bar uh, is the late 1960s, and we can see in the late 1960s that there were 6 million acres of forest land that were seedling and sapling. Uh, and that was matched against about 4 million acres of forest land that was classified as saw timber. Uh, as as those um, agricultural lands had been essentially abandoned and in the, in the conversion of agricultural land to forest land had largely subsided by the mid-1950s, the, um, the infusion of early successional agricultural land was starting to decline. And so the abundance of seedling saplings decreased through time up until 2008, where we're down to about 2 million acres of seedling sapling. And as you well know, as those seedlings and saplings get bigger, they grow into larger size classes. And now we have almost or about 9 million acres of forest land that is classified as saw timber. So this, there's two points that I think I want to make here. There's two points that I know that I want to make here. One point is, New York and the Northeast have a valuable saw timber resource, and uh, that's evident by the abundance of um, opportunities for harvesting saw timber and, and interactions with the forest products industry. By the same token, it's also another point is that we are not uh, recruiting uh, additional acreage in any measurable fashion into the seedling sapling size class. If we're in, in the harvest data for 2005 in New York, um, and there's the publication that I reference, uh, showed that there was about 750 million board feet harvested in New York. And if you, if you make five on one percent of the forest land, so one percent of Um, active harvesting, you would expect to see a fair amount of sunlight that's available for regeneration. Uh, I'll show you some other slide here in a minute that says that maybe that, that harvesting is not as intense as that. The 
released on a stand level basis and it may be that the, the classification process is such that the overstory that they're not Okay, this is a, um, a picture from the New York State Forest Resources and Assessment Strategy documents. So it's the strategy. Woodland sapling trees and understory are not counted. They are counted. So this previous, so let me maybe. applied at the stand level. So a stand similarly a seedling sapling is happening um, in a way that it's not changing slide and we say, okay, if there are seedlings and saplings being established, what are those? In 2008 and looking at Increasing and in when when you what so what you're looking for is a for a red bar that is my math right a 15 year time span we see that there are four species that are more abundant in 2000. are slightly more abundant, balsam fir about the same, so the balsam fir and the spruces are about an 8% increase, but what you would consider the winner in this is, an Amer is American beach, where there's roughly a 26% increase these increases by zooming in on the graph. I didn't have the absolute numbers, so that's why there's a tilde saying that these are approximate rates of increase. Um, corresponding to this, but I believe using the same data, uh, the, the Nature Conservancy uh, publication Table 4 illustrates, on page 13, illustrates that beech is the most abundant um, species in their advanced regeneration categories. So we are regenerating trees. But the concern is, of course, that you'll know, many of you will recognize that beech is, is a wonderful species, has a lot of nice properties, but has some attributes that because of its uh, non-preference by deer and its, um, its susceptibility to beech bark disease uh, is not the species that we want to be dominating our understory. Here I'm, I'm wanting to illustrate um, a couple of things. One, I, I've made the case earlier that we have an abundance of saw timber and that saw timber is going to correspond to forest harvesting and in fact it has and we can see that the markets for the four most common species in New York at least um, have been uh, interesting and dynamic from the late 1980s up until uh, this most recent stumpage price report. Uh, the green line is black cherry, and this is this is stumpage prices. And for those of you not familiar with stumpage, stumpage is the value of timber standing on the stump. And this is the the New York State DEC stumpage price report. I ne neglected to give a link, but if you do a search for 
NYS DEC stumpage price report. It's the, I believe it's the first hit you'll find. You can see the black cherry. All of these species in the late 1980s had relatively similar and by comparison today or comparison to about 10 years ago had relatively low uh, values, stumpage values. Uh, about 1992 there was an expansion of the value, the stumpage values of these trees. Some of them like black cherry and sugar maple or hard maple had very strong responses and had a five-fold or a uh, seven-fold increase in value over a span of a little more than 10 years. There's some volatility you can see in black cherry. It has its ups and downs. But all of the species in about 2007 to 2006 to 2008 started to have a precipitous decline. The one exception to that is white ash that has had fairly stable value, stumpage values over time except in the last three years where there has been a slight increase. So we are harvesting trees. Uh, those trees have values. The markets change through time. Um, but, but the woodlots are being managed and um, woodlots are being managed and timber is being harvested. Martin asks about the value of ash is up, but what about EAB? Emerald ash borer is, uh, is present in New York State. It's present in many of the, well, it's present, let me think here. Connecticut and Massachusetts. Somebody from there will have to will remind me. I think it may be in both of those. It's certainly in Pennsylvania, almost all of the Midwestern states. So it's surprisingly that uh, even as EAB came in, there's been an increase in the value of ash. So and there has been statewide, I would suspect, uh, in, in, in an increase in the harvesting intensity of white ash. So this is the slide that makes me um, that that's, uh, calls into question some of my earlier uh, assumptions about harvesting being restricted to one percent of the forest land base. This admittedly is old data. I'm not able to find anything more recent, but we need to filter this and, and recognize that this data is almost 20 years old, or the reporting of it is almost 20 years old. Some of this is, is even older, pushing 30 years. What this illustrates is the percent of basal area, so the percent of the volume of wood, effectively, that was removed from timberland between the 19, early 1980s and, and mid-1990s. What it shows is that there was zero removal on uh, two-thirds of the forest land. Some of that was because you may remember in the in the, in the 19, early 1980s, some of that was pole timbered, so it didn't really have commercial value. But, and there's also the attitudes of owners that aren't interested in harvesting. So there's the majority of forest land at that time had not been harvested. Where the harvesting did occur, so there's 32% of the land that was harvested, half of that removed less than 20% of the basal area. So there were very light cuts. Um, 9% removed less than 40%. And then when you think about what would be more intensive harvests, only 7%, 8% of that total land base was, uh, was being intensively harvest, harvested. So cutting was occurring, but I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, my observationally and what I've heard and uh, what these data suggest is that that harvesting was at a fairly light level and scattered across the landscape. So we're not creating the high sunlight conditions that existed at the turn of the previous century when many of these species regenerated. And combined with that, we have a development of a beach understory and invasive species that are, um, that are dominating and creating a low level of shade. Uh, the other factor that was that was changing that we mentioned was the presence of deer. Uh, deer in New York were largely extirpated by the late uh, 1880s, early 1900s. They've made a, a very successful comeback, and this is looking at this is a, a proxy measure of deer abundance. I think the last I've heard in New York is in Pennsylvania is that there are a million deer in the state. Uh, this is looking at the harvest of deer. The harvest 
uh, collective harvest for bucks and does in the late 1970s was about 87,000, up to a quarter of a million in the late 1990s. Um, and those that states and Midwestern states is far in excess of what it. Um, Uh, we make some assumptions, and so we need to bracket this and that. And um, this is their, you know, deer are essentially a, a glorified goat or sheep, but they so they need to have this fresh. that are captured in the background picture of this slide. It would take about 600 of those seedlings exclusively on four each individual This uh, might not be a big deal, if, and if we had uh, more have rather are um, many deer per square mile, and those deer are having a profound. Yes, I wasn't in New York at the time. Um, I were hunting in New York. Nominally family owned. Most of these owners, and I didn't provide this data, but the Forest Service has data that suggests that most of these harvests happen in the absence of a forester. Probably the, the majority of increase in the deer herd size, and that, and that increase is associated with potentially strong impacts on the forest. So a little bit of biology and ecology for natural regeneration. Uh, trees need to have, forests need a seed source, those, or to a quality stem, uh, a stem of quality that we can utilize as part of our, uh, part of our needs. argue to break some of these out or add some more in, but essentially in the general sense we need to have a successful overlap and where that overlap occurs in terms of sunlight and soil conditions and in the absence of seed and seedling predators, we're able to successfully regenerate forests. All right, Bill. Hi, Bill. Um, wants to know about the species representing the 600 seedlings per pound. That, I believe, was based on um, some work the Extension Forester Northwestern PA did, and that would have probably been uh, maple and cherry. Um, and it would be buds and leaves, but the leaves don't add an awful lot of weight. Neither do the buds. So I have not gone in and, and verified those weights. So,
sorry. So we have um, we have to have this overlap in the conditions that I'm that I'm seeing and that I think um, exist in many parts of the Northeast favor seedlings that are resistant to deer browsing. They're tolerant of shade. They have the ability to propagate abundantly and often at a young age and to disperse widely. Uh, given that, we are um, we're, we're, we're shifting the conditions from the species that are desirable to species that are potentially less desirable. So the, the commercial species that are de desirable, these are hardwood, sugar maple, white ash, black cherry, red oak, yellow birch, red maple, tend to be more tolerant or immediate of shade. They're preferentially browsed, and they lack some of the robust um, reproductive strategies that the non-commercial species have, such as seed banks and the ability to root sucker. So American beech and striped maple and black birch and hop hornbeam tend to be tolerant of shade. They're, they're low on the browse preference. They have uh, multiple or very effective reproductive strategies. They reproduce early and in some cases have many of the characteristics of the invasive or non-native species. Um, and that's why I lump invasives in these species together in a, in a category known as interfering. So I've tried to make the case that there is, in fact, a forest regeneration problem. This, the survey that we did uh, indicated where we had a fairly rigid definition of successful regeneration that only 30 percent of the stands were successful. That would be moderately or, or fully successful. Uh, 70 percent were marginally successful or failures. Uh, the, the Nature Conservancy study had a, um, used an index and, and because of that index included seedlings that were shorter than five feet, they had a, a more uh, generous definition of what regeneration success was and correspondingly had a higher level of favorable regeneration. So we could, you know, you could, you can't, these two studies I think very well complement each other. Uh, it's interesting they happened in the same year and largely uh, and in fact independent of each other and um, but yet arrived at basically the same conclusion. So if there's a regeneration problem, uh, what we want to do is try and identify the threats um, and some strategies, some management strategies to mitigate against those. And there are three primary concerns that, that I want to address. And, and as we get beyond this uh, towards the end and we have questions, I, I welcome others of you who have seen other threats than these three. So the first of these, uh, and we'll, we'll, kind of, uh, we'll kind of sneak into these. Um, and you can probably guess the three that we're thinking of, but um, the first one uh, centers around some things like, have you heard this? I'll just cut the big ones so the little ones can grow. Cutting trees is good for wildlife. I'll leave the hollow ones, which make good den trees. I won't clear cut because everybody knows clear cutting is bad. Uh, I say that tongue in cheek. Um, I'll just selectively cut or uh, you give a give a more quantitative response and talk about the growth rates of the trees. In essence, what's happening is you have a hardwood forest that might look something like this, and decisions are made uh, simply and strictly on economic criteria. And so when you look at this forest and you think about the economic criteria, which trees are you going to cut? Uh, you're going to cut these trees, and the black arrows don't do justice, but here's a red oak and a white ash and a black cherry. And so those three trees would be harvested and what you're left behind with is a beach and a beach and a beach and a beach and somewhere I remember seeing a red maple. Maybe there's a red maple right there. So you're shifting the composition, you're shifting the value, you're shifting the uh, growth potential of this forest and importantly you're eliminating a seed source. So you're eliminating effectively the faster growing species if you're doing a diameter limit cut or a high grade so that
wins the race uh, should be to go uh, into breeding stock and not go into the glue factory and, and garage sale analogies. But high grading diameter limit cutting these, this is a problem for forest regeneration for two reasons, because it changes the mixture of species that are able to produce seed um, because it's a low intensity So for those two reasons. Oh, so this is a picture of a, of a high graded stand uh, that I visited after the fact and it was, I'm standing on a road behind me is the, uh, is the rest of the stand that was marked but as at that point had not been cut and it was, it was a really dramatic illustration of she had with a crop tree release and, and a conversion into a, um, a nicer stand. So there's some strategies that we can This is not something that we're going to participate in. Uh, woodland owners need to find and work with competent professional economics and sustainability. These are, there are real limitations that need to be addressed. Um, and have a property that has been high graded. Um, what you need to do is there are essentially, you know, four things that you want to try to accomplish. You want to increase the abundance How you do that is uh, dependent upon the frequency and extent of high grading. You know, part that gives a simple characterization of that. So this was a chart that I put together a couple years ago, and uh, I, th I think stems per acre, you have a different set of options and a different set of tools than somebody that's in the wow you have fewer than five desirable stems per acre. Um, this is, so this is, and there's a link to this webinar that I gave um, that I'll show you in just a minute. But there's actually, I'd call your attention to two other webinars that, I, that are more recent. And earlier this year, they're both uh, addressing the topic of rehabilitating high graded stands. All right, so that was the first threat. The second threat, some of these pictures load slowly. The second threat deals with interfering vegetation. Uh, there's lots of forms of interfering vegetation. This can be native, it can be non-native. It may happen because of uh, disease issues, for example, with beach brush. It may happen because of past management practices that were well-intentioned but just went south. Uh, and, there's, and there's a long list of species that can be involved with this. So Mark says, with diameter limit cuts, I can find properties with several categories on your chart, all within 30 acres. Yes, and that's one of the characteristics of, of diameter limit cuts and, and exploited stands is the heterogeneity. And so uh, the work that Dr. Nyland has been doing and, um, 
he gave three workshops this summer on rehabilitating degraded stands. I understand he's, well, I've, I, know, I can't say that. He may be doing some of those again next year. If you have a chance to see one of Dr. Nyland's workshops on that, I can vouch for the fact that it's well worth the time. In terms of the second threat with interfering vegetation, it creates a low shade and that inhibits intolerant species. And remember, many of our desirable species, black cherry uh, in particular, uh, red oak, uh, to a lesser extent, uh, sugar maple and red maple, are, uh, need sunlight. All trees need sunlight. Sugar maple is going to be tolerant, but there's going to be a, a negative synergy between the low shade, the slow growth rates, and the presence of deer. So we need to be able to control interfering vegetation before we're able to regenerate. The interfering vegetation responds well to partial cutting, so even small uh, openings are going to have potentially a negative effect. And we have either mechanical controls or chemical controls we can use. And we'll talk about those in just a minute. The problem with these undesirable or interfering forest plants are several. First, there's a negative synergy with deer. And some work has been done where you've excluded deer and retained interfering vegetation. And you get some positive response of desirable species. But I'm not aware that by just completely, that you can completely deal with the problem just by excluding deer. The, the mechanism that happens, the inhibition, uh, is a couple of, of a couple of factors. One, from the physiology of the tree, that low shade absorbs the 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 red wavelengths of light and changes the ratio of red to far red light. That changing ratio reduces the germination of some species, and the red light is where the energy is. That's absorbed by the interfering plants, so there's less energy, less growth potential for the light that makes it to the forest floor and the, and the desirable seedlings. That low shade, particularly when you have uh, vegetation like ferns, creates nice habitat for seed predators, mice, and voles. Uh, the end result, though, is a decrease in the variety of habitat for wildlife and changes in the ecosystem functions um, associated with some of the species, such as the uh, invasive species like garlic mustard. So which habitats are going to be invaded or impacted by interfering plants depends on many things. It depends upon the characteristics of the species, the intensity and scale and frequency of the disturbance, uh, the characteristics of the native species, how abundant they are, whether they're already established, whether they compete with, they're able to compete with whatever is in Management options. Uh, this is from a, a presentation. That I'll show you the, the link. Uh, and these will all be, I'll, I'll save this as a PDF and post it to my website so that you'll be able to come in and, and click on all of these links if you want to go back and follow up on any of these. Because any and whether or not there are consequences to taking no action. In some cases, it may not be warranted. Um, and, or thinking about, are there other priority sites and species combinations, because there's always a limitation of time and money and energy. versus the desirable plants. If there's uh, it's almost easier if there's no desirable plants because it gives you a broader spectrum of man. The, the not obvious costs. There's the out-of-pocket costs for labor. What are the ecological or environmental costs associated with each control option? And the corresponding costs of not being effective. I break out uh, management options into two different categories. The, the target specificity. So we can have a selective mechanical control treatment. 
treatment, such as hand pulling, as an example. A selective chemical control treatment would be a cut stump. And you can, you can see this. And you can imagine there are lots of different examples that you could put into chemical. Uh, these are just some examples. The, the upper picture is, a, is the use of goats uh, or other types of livestock. Uh, some will help keep them reduced. This is a long-term strategy. hand corner and the bottom edge is this all-terrain mower, a FECON, does a fabulous job. Uh, this is on a property here in central New York, uh, Brett Chedzoy's property where he's creating sobo pasture. The FECON uh, essentially rototills the surface, maneuvers around desirable stems, um, and then livestock are used to, it's a one-two punch. The livestock then to suppress those undesirables as they um, as they re-sprout, if they re-sprout. Broadcast chemical, whether by a machine or by a backpack sprayer, would be the, the uh, corresponding chemical uh, to the mechanical broadcast. I'm trying to talk a little bit faster here because we're running out of time. Internet resources here, you can see uh, several good resources available. And I'll just point out that in uh, early 2003, there's a um, uh, Nature Conservancy uh, ecologist from Vermont who's agreed to do a webinar. So we'll be that you'll see that announcement if you're in the loop. All right, the third and final threat you've already guessed is deer. Uh, this is what they do to stump sprouts. This is what they do to seedlings. Continually browse them back. It's uncommon to go into a woodlot and find, at least in the woodlots I've been in, uh, and find hardwood seedlings that don't have multiple tops and evidence of browse by deer. There are three basic strategies to control the impacts of deer. Uh, and the, I'm not a, not a deer person per se. The deer people that I work with think about um, controlling the impacts rather than necessarily controlling the herd. Uh, one way, I mean, controlling the herd is through hunting. Um, th these are, are rural woodland options. These are not suburban kinds of options necessarily. So hunting, if you have a program that, that concentrates the harvest on female deer uh, and you do that aggressively, you can limit the size of the herd. We've done that at the Cornell University Arnott Forest and are seeing Sorry about that. Am I back? OK, good. <laughs> That's kind of strange. All right, thank you. Thank you. So hopefully we can get through this. Um, so hunting is an option. Uh, hunting can be very cost effective because hunters will come in and pay to do the hunting. Um, but then it's also maybe a little less definite. Uh, more definite are a tree by tree approach where uh, you put in tree tubes uh, and you can do this. Uh, this is typically on a smaller scale. You have an opening. You can see here is an opening and there's an individual seedling that's being perpetuated or some kind of fencing on a larger scale that excludes deer 
And as I understand it, in Pennsylvania, I believe, does a lot of this. Uh, and there's still a need within these harvest zones to make sure that um, that deer that get in, and invariably they do, that somebody takes care of the deer that, that get in. There are uh, several resources that are available. Um, last fall, uh, uh, Dr. J. So there's, there's a lot about deer hunting and deer management relative to hardwood regeneration. So those are the, those are the biggies. To summarize, um, our current forests developed in a different set of circumstances than our current forests are developing in. And we have uh, at least three significant threats. The, the survey work that we've done uh, suggests that in particular deer and interfering vegetation are the two dominant threats. Uh, add into that high grading is kind of a slow uh, death by attrition of these forests as desirable seed sources are being extracted uh, and the capacity of the forest to reproduce itself is going to be limited. Um, the summary of solutions, um, I, I think is talking about some tax policies that make uh, fencing potentially effective uh, and feasible in Pennsylvania. We have to be conscious of the seed source and utilize the seed source uh, to establish the next forest um, in concert with efforts to control interference. And uh, owners and managers need to be jointly committed to doing this. You know, in the last poll, there's foresters who are concerned about the forest, and also forest owners who are concerned about the forest. So this is not something that uh, there, there's no one segment that's that's problematic in this. Uh, we all need to work together. So I think that's it. There, here's some resources that are available. Um, again, all of these I'll put these up as a PDF, and so from that PDF you'll be able to click on the links and access these directly. So let me jump over to a new window, and you all can it will open up a browser in your in your web software, a window in your browser, and then that's a it's a it's about a two-minute survey, but it's particularly helpful to me because it, it provides guidance to these to this webinar series. I'll also call your attention to the to the website where uh, you can have access to this information. This is going to be this is our Cornell Forest Connect.ning.com site, and. Um, uh, and, and that's a place that you can go. That's that's where I will post the link. With these treatments for regeneration, great question. So, uh, um, and, and I'll try. I, I watched the presidential debates bits of it last night, and I'll try not to do a, a political response where I answer a different question and give you a non-answer to your question. But some of that is going to depend, obviously. But to give you some quick general guidance, and I can speak mostly about vegetation management costs. There may be some other folks that have done some some fencing costs, vegetation management, uh, broadcast chemical treatments are going to be on the order of 150 to, well, so I've heard of it as low as about $100 per acre. We had a, a forest herbicide workshop in western New York earlier this week. And there was a contractor there that did backpack mist blowers and uh, on small scale and on steep slopes. And uh, he said that, that his bids would typically run when he would bid a job would be in the 90 to $150 per acre range. 
So if you can, and then the, some of the, the skitter mounted mist blowers are on the higher end of that. They're going to be doing larger acreage, uh, more restricted terrain. They're going to be, I've heard prices in the 150 to 175 per acre. So th those are, that's a ballpark. The fencing costs, I should, I'll throw out a number, uh, which I shouldn't do because I'm not certain of it. I'd perhaps defer or, or strongly encourage you to go look at Mike Jacobson's uh, Penn State forest fencing fact sheet. Uh, my memory is it's something on the order of a dollar per, per foot of perimeter. So if you have a one acre parcel, uh, you have 800 feet, so you're looking at about 800 acres. So as you get bigger, or $800 for an acre, that doesn't mean $800 per acre, because as you get bigger, you get the efficiencies of that of that um, edge to interior. So uh, hopefully somebody that's that's participating has some experience with fencing and can offer some insights into that. And there are some there are different ways to go about fencing. So and I'm not familiar with all of those. Any other questions or observations? So I asked some rhetorical questions earlier. Are we regenerating our forests? And I'm wondering if uh, how folks feel about that. Thank you, Jessica. This was, a, this was a presentation. The, the core of this I developed a few years ago with Gary Goff, and so I want to make sure I give Gary credit. There were, um, but I expanded it a lot to focus more on some of the management um, aspects. So Lou, hi Lou. Let me see if I got that still here. Yep, so here's that link for continuing education credits. If you click on that Cornell.Qualtrics site, that should take you there. Caroline, Southern Ontario. Don't see a problem with region, but it seems we have way less deer, too. Um, that's to your great benefit. And uh, that's one of, the, one of the characteristics in the Adirondacks, uh, which is probably a higher, I don't, know where, I don't know about elevations in Ontario, southern Ontario, but in the Adirondacks you have higher elevations, heavier snow, uh, parts of Vermont and New Hampshire certainly would fall, and Maine would fall into this category where there's, there's uh, environmental controls of that at some level. So Caroline, I would say do what you can to keep those deer populations low. Mark's asking about the absorption of red light effects on energy balance. Uh, New Oak guidelines call for thinning from below, still having red light absorbed. So there's um, the red light, far red light is, is a fascinating thing and I, I won't be able to speak in a silvopasture, um, silviculture textbook. And the, the thinning from below, so there, there's the, the, the height of that. Think about this as kind of a, think about the strata of applications for the um, for the amount of, for the changes in light quality. And, and the, the, the canopy filter that's close to the ground has a more negative impact than a canopy filter that's high from the ground. So the, so the main canopy filters the light, and I don't know if there are changes. light to get down to the forest floor. The reference that I saw, and this was also a, a presentation I saw by a, a weed scientist, was the ratio as, as the ratio of 
know what the actual ratio is, but as it shifts in favor of far red, that inhibits. And then a ground layer, well-established ground layer, thousands of seedlings per acre of sugar maple and red maple and red oak. So at least for hardwood seedlings, I'm not, I need to look into whether or not that ratio has an impact on seed germination. It does have an impact on growth rates. Um, I have I've heard stories of what moose will do in the woods. I was actually on a tour a few years ago, and where was that? I was in Quebec, northern Ontario, and they took us into an area where deer moose had been getting in and rubbing antlers and, and munching on hardwood seedlings. They have, I don't know how many, somebody will have to Google and see how many pounds of fresh weight a day a moose will eat. Thank you, Stephen. $3 a linear foot plus extra for corners and gates. So there you have it. So you can do, uh, thank you, Don. Um, so somebody could do a calculation, and if you know there are 43,560 square feet in an acre, you could calculate, at least for squares and rectangles, pretty easily uh, what you might be looking to spend to have a, a commercial vendor come in and put it up. Um, John says, Vermont Fish and Wildlife is connecting forest landowners with too many deer with hunters via website. Wow, great idea. Hopefully that does work. Um, good hunting pressure, good. Erica asks about selecting tree seedling species with thought given to future climate changes. Um, that's uh, a lot of people are talking about that and thinking about that. There are um, there are certainly species. So the, the the challenge is to find species that will grow now and be and have a, the amplitude of environmental capacity, physiological capacity to adapt to those changes. And there are some species that are going to be um, some species are going to be more. Um, robust in that capacity than others. Uh, the the uh, a property that my wife and I own has a fair amount of red oak and eastern white pine, which I'm thinking, I think about the geographic range of those uh, where we're located, we're towards the northern end of the, of the geographic range of northern red oak, and we're kind of in the middle of eastern white pine. So certainly in my lifetime, um, I don't think I have too much to worry about there, but those are those are, are deliberate considerations that owners should make, particularly as they're adjusting species composition through thinnings and what have you. Dave Smith, thank you. Taking a closer look at a regeneration situation on state lands as our stands get towards maturity. Yes, particularly plantations. Already have used some herbicide treatments, and this is I, I think a lot of foresters, and I'm I'm by no means you know on the front edge of this. There are a lot of foresters that are very aware of and very conscious of the um, the the potential for concern and the need to regenerate. And foresters 80 years ago were worried about plantation establishment and planting trees because the landscape had been um, deforested through agriculture, converted to agriculture from forest land. So as, as the forests mature, our focus on different issues has changed. Peter says, comment on foliar spraying to control beech stump sprouting. Um, so there are, uh, there's a, I, I gave a webinar actually on beach management a few years ago, so I'll add that to the list. That's probably the best thing. There's also a fact sheet that, that Dr. Nyland and I wrote on beach management. Um, there are three basic ways you control beach. Uh, the most cost-effective way is a cut stump treatment when you have firewood-sized and larger beach. Um, those are cut, they're sold for firewood, and you can maybe get a break-even uh, economic balance between the sale of the firewood stumpage and the cost of cutting and treating the stumps. 
that also allows you then, and, and all of these products use glyphosate, which has the greatest mobility into the stump. Uh, the, the limiting factor is that it needs to be done essentially between uh, early May and mid-October uh, for best results. So we're going to do some testing um, over the winter to see if we can do some winter stump treatments. The, the next uh, option, if you lack some of those firewood-sized trees, are to do some kind of a mechanical or chemical girdling, hack and squirt, or basal bark treatments that has no movement of, of the chemical or essentially no movement into the uh, extensively into the root system and controlling of root suckers. Uh, the stump, cut stump treatment, you can use Garlon uh, 4, Garlon 3A, those will, all of them will control So we're differentiating root sprouting and stump sprouting. And then finally, if you don't have any, essentially no big trees, you just have younger trees, then there's uh, foliar treatments. Um, precipitous decline in the concentration of active ingredient that you're using. So you're going from a 25% active ingredient down to a 3, 2, 3, 6% active ingredient for foliar treatments. So, Peter, I'm not sure if that's... Um, there are the Terry's uh, talking about the um, ability to get nuisance permits for deer. There are thresholds. ...to work together that you can get some permits, but still you, I don't think you get very many. So that may have to happen. There are uh, citizen task forces that, that set targets. You can, my experience, I have very limited experience, but if you apply that during the winter to a cut surface of a stump, my experience is that it will kill the stump, it will prevent re-sprouting of the stump in frozen wood, but that it will not move in the wood. And um, Comes active the next year. So you could also use other treatments like a Garlon 4, uh, which is an oil uh, as, a, as a winter treatment. If your goal, it depends on if your goal is to control just the stump or if you're like with beech, if you also want to control the root suckers. Um, beavers and groundhogs. Wow. Um, I would say they, I've never heard of groundhogs being a problem to forest regeneration, but I, I, I've never heard of it, but I don't, so I don't know to what extent they might be. Beaver are a problem, you know, pretty much in areas where they occur, so they would be potentially localized problems, but where they do create problems, they can be very problematic. That doesn't say much, does it? Um, deer are political. Yes, I agree, Mark. from now, or in December, and then a couple more in early February. Um, so uh, Peter, on the, on the leaf, uh, foliar treatment of beech and ferns may not be, the month of May might be problematic. You can, the I don't have experience with this, but there are some concerns that if you, if you hit it too early in the year, you'll get a brown off of the foliage. It's a feel-good kind of thing, but, but you don't get translocation into the root systems to kill the individual plant.
herbicide treatments. If, if it's in a drought, the plants shut down physiologically and so you'll have less control. So, you, so what you ideally have is a pretty robust growing season. You do the treatment um, and then you'll get good translocation. Yes, and, and um, fern may add, you might want to do, so there's a oust as a chemical that is essentially a pre-emergent uh, which controls some of the seeds. Uh, lasts for about a year and depending upon some other species that may be present that might have some other options. Um, Paul asks about uh, herbicide use. There was a link to Dave Jackson in Penn State uh, at Penn State and his forest vegetation um, uh, forest vegetation management website. Dave Jackson has great information on his site. He, have a, he had a fabulous uh, webinar earlier this year in February. Maybe there's a link. Uh, and if you go to the Forest Connect page and, and scroll backwards through the archived and saved webinars, you can find his link. It's very good resources. Um, that's, that's the best place that I can send people. I'll also say that that uh, forestconnect.ning, Cornell forestconnect.ning site that you see in red, the top center of the page, there's a lot of discussion there about the use of herbicides. So people all around the Northeast that are using different herbicides in different um, situations are sharing their successes and failures. So I would, I would encourage people to participate in that. Uh, it's a place to ask questions and answer questions. Yeah, poison ivy is never fun, is it? So. Herb says stumps July to September. Yes, I've had good luck. And usually I recommend from uh, the 4th of July until Columbus Day is a good window. Uh, at the workshop I was at earlier this week, the, the reality is that you know you can't, you know, private landowners have that flexibility. Foresters that are working with landowners can't do all of their beach work in the summer. That would be ideal. Uh, so we're going to try to find some other strategies uh, where we might be able to have effective control of root suckers with uh, winter cutting options. The stump treatment chemicals are, uh, the active ingredient is glyphosate. And glyphosate is the, the common trade name is Roundup or Rodeo or Accord XRT2. The thing you need to be cautious of in New York is that the target species is supposed to be listed explicitly on the label. So if you read the chemical label, uh, and I have a, I've started a new uh, page on that Ning site that's just for forest herbicides, where I link to other resources. Um, there's, and you can, there's a place where you can go. Cornell has a contract with DEC to maintain all of the pesticide labels that are registered in New York. You can grab those for free offline, uh, off the internet, and, and make sure that beech is a listed species. So something like rodeo, for example, does not list beech as a target species. Um, I'm going to look into getting a 2EE supplemental label so that so that beech is included as a legal species to be treated with Roundup. But any of the glyphosate products that have beech will work. So those include things like Razor Pro and Ranger Pro, Accord XRT2, um, Roundup Pro, and Roundup Pro Max, I think all, all include that. So Ranger Pro, Razor Pro, Roundup Pro Max, Roundup Pro, Accord, XRT2. Okay, with that, it's pushing 1.30 and you all probably want to take a lunch break. Uh, thanks very much for sticking with this for so long. Oh, and I, I'm, I'll, I've got, I still have coffee here, so I'm happy to sit and chat for a while longer, but we'll see what, uh, what other folks have. Uh, Boar cut beach because many of them are hollow and can get you in trouble if you don't have enough wood for hinge. Yes, indeed, Herb, thank you. Any cutting should use boar cutting, directional felling, get involved with game of logging, and be safe, safe, safe in the woods. Caroline, thank you. Mark, thank you. It's always fun. These are great, great opportunities. I, and I learn a lot hearing questions and feedback from you all. 
Okay, I'm going to turn off the recording and wish you all a